Wow. I was wrestling with what I wanted to bring on the day that we ended our fast, most of us. The Holy Spirit said, you know what, you need to talk about what we should be hearing from God. What we, should, what we should be hearing from God, or maybe how we should be hearing it, or maybe where we should be when we're hearing it. And uh, man, he took me right to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10 is where most of you be. We know the story, but it's so awesome how God just pulls things out and reveals things, right? You know, I always, you always hear me say that to many of you have heard me say, you know, pray that God reveals himself to you. And you know what? He, he reveals himself every Sunday. Amen. Amen. Every Sunday. And he reveals himself to each person differently. It's amazing how that even works. I don't even understand how that works. Because we're all in a different place with our relationship with him. Hopefully going forward, right? Our word for the year, forward. Hopefully going forward. But we're all in a different place, so the Holy Spirit's taking the same message, and he knows exactly what he needs to say to each person, including the teens. Yes, the teens. That would be cool. Oh, my goodness. First Samuel 3, verses 1 through 10. Now, you've heard this before. Let me change this. Just because it's going to be part of the message. You've listened to this before. Now I want you to hear it. Okay? Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. That means he was in training. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time. While Eli, while Eli was laying down in his place. Please remember that. <coughs> Eli was lying down in his place. Initially, we're reading Eli was down in his place. And when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out of the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord God called Samuel and he answered, here am I. So Samuel runs into Eli and said, here I am. You called me. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Lie down again, you crazy kid. <laughs> and he went and he laid down. Then the Lord called yet again. Samuel. So Samuel rose, went to Eli, and said, here I am. For you called me. It sounds like my house. For you called me. And Eli answered again, I did not call my son. Lie down again, you crazy kid. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. It's a process. He doesn't even know the Lord yet. But the Lord already knows what he's going to do with Samuel. Hello? If you're sitting here this morning and you don't know the Lord, trust me, he knows what he wants to do with you. Amen. <laughs> Every single one of you sitting here breathing, he knows exactly what he wants to do with you. Saved or unsaved, he needs you to get saved so he can use you next. So Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Samuel did not know the Lord yet. So, verse 8. And the Lord God called Samuel again, the third time, right? So he arose, went to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Can you see this? <laughs> then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Verse 9, Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went. What do we 
we see here this third time he lays down? Samuel went and did what? Like laid down where? In his place. In his place. Didn't see that the first two times, did we? He was just laying down. Now we see him laying down in his place. Now the Lord God came and stood and called as at other times. Samuel! Samuel! And Samuel answered, Speak for your servant hears. So now he's speaking, not running into Eli and waking the poor guy up. Do you know that God has Paul waiting? <laughs> Do you, you know that? Yep. How many of you have called somebody and you were just secretly hoping for voicemail? <laughs> because you didn't really want to actually talk to them. Or was that, that just a crazy thinking on my part, right? You've never done that, right? And sometimes we, sometimes we think God's like that, like, like he wants somebody else. Like he's calling and he's just hoping to leave a message. As if he's really happy to not have to deal with you. Okay, so here's the question. I know the answer why. They got all the answers. Does God make mistakes? No. 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 And equivocally, he does not make mistakes. Amen? No. When he calls, he wants you, he chose you, he put the genetics in you, the DNA is in you, amen? The passion is in, you might not even know it yet. The passion is in you. The opportunity, listen to me, is for you. The blessing is for you. Man, the Christians have missed their blessings. So that's why you don't have to be insecure or bitter or jealous because what call he has for you is for you. And he's calling you. He didn't accidentally call you. He didn't butt dial you. Okay? <laughs> he didn't accidentally call you because he intended to maybe reach me. Right? Because he doesn't make mistakes. As everybody just cleared up. Now the enemy, on the other hand, wants us to be confused. Right? We talk about that a lot. And we need to constantly talk about Pastor, you said it almost every time. Yeah, because we need reminded. Look what's going on out of the world. Yep. The enemy wants us to be confused and confounded in every way. And he will use anything he can to confuse us. The culture confuses us in our calling. Our contacts, the people we have in our phone contacts, the people we serve ourselves with, they confuse us in our calling sometimes, many times. So we let our calling conflict with us sometimes as well. We sometimes are our own worst enemy when it comes to our calling. We really are. We doubt the call because it wasn't Jesus in the flesh holding our shoulders square with his as he glares into our eyes telling our distracted ears exactly what he wants us to do. You with me? I mean, I mean you can catch a picture of that. You know, I mean, if you, if you had Jesus holding your shoulders and squaring you in the eyes, I mean, yeah, okay. Let's go to the pastor circle verse. <clears throat> then even if we know what he wants us to do, we justify, I've heard this, we justify our delay of obedience by questioning how, why, or when. Sounds justified to our ears. We're just supposed to obey. Hello? We're just supposed to obey. And he's clearly saying now, he's saying now, more than ever, Christian, he's saying now. He will position the how. You don't always need to know why. He just wants you to obey, Jonah. <laughs> This isn't even the story about Jonah, but hey. And this calling of Samuel, it's, it's kind of cool because you see that God will repeat things. He will. He's patient, isn't he? Do you notice when you're shopping for a specific car, for example, that you begin seeing that 
that type of car everywhere. Isn't that the weirdest thing? I always thought it was bizarre. <laughs> yep. I mean, they were there all the time <laughs> in the first place, but you just never noticed them because you weren't in the market. Right? I mean, it's kind of, you know, you weren't seeing them because you weren't in the market. And we need to get in the market for God, amen? amen. We need to get in the market for yep. God so that when He is calling, we are hearing and listening. There's a difference. Ask my wife. <laughs> When God wants to get a message across to you, He will put you in the market for it. Okay? You hear something in a sermon. Or you hear a friend say something that just resonates. Just resonates with you. The next thing you know, you hear it in a movie. Right? And then you, you listen to K-Love. And you hear it in the song. And you hear it, you're hearing it at work. And you got a bunch of heathens there, but you hear it at work. Usually. That's <laughs> not always... I used to work for that. Yeah, they're all safe as far as I know. But God will validate. This is what's cool. God will validate his call to you in many ways, but you need to be positioned. You need to be positioned to hear it and then listen. So when you get in the market for God, you begin to realize he was speaking all along. He was speaking all along. He'll give confirmations. And then you just start noticing little things as he is revealing himself to you. So, again, don't miss your blessing. Man, there's a lot of people in here I know can speak to that. There's someone here that are like, I don't want to miss my blessing. Good, this message is for you. <laughs> when you're hearing God's call, then you need to discern. We saw Eli discerning here, right? In verse 8, where it says, And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. It took a few times for even Eli. Eli! That was lying in his place. Right? It even took some time for him, but he still, there was still that discernment. And then that advice to Samuel. So then we see what Eli tells Samuel there in verse 9. First Samuel 3, verse 9. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you, that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. How many times have you, Christian, have said, hear my Lord, hear my, hear my. We should be saying that daily. Hear my, hear my. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. So check this out. Eli's greatest revelation, God showed me this, happened while he was resting. Did you notice that? He, well, he, Eli's greatest revelation happened while he was resting. Eli didn't say to Samuel, that, that might be God. That might be God. You, you better run out and catch him before he leaves. Right? Eli didn't say to Samuel, if God spoke to you, then you better chase him down. He didn't say that. Listen to me. Listen. If it's God speaking, then he's going to come back. You just need to be in position. You need to be in position. That's all we need to do. And you know, when we're fasting and praying like we're doing, that is purposefully positioning ourselves. Do you know how that pleases God in your relationship with him? When you're fasting and praying, he's watching you position yourself so you can be hearing and listening. FYI, the kids aren't in here, but it's okay. God doesn't play hide and seek. Alright? You know, he's not in the tabernacle, you know, going over to the table and hide behind the bread and say, oh, here you go. He's not hiding. He's not hiding. And even, even though God is always moving, amen, he's never hiding. Think about this. The tabernacle was a portable fixture, right? To be set up in the wilderness because the Israelites never knew. They never knew when God was going to say stop or when he was going to say go, right? Why? Because God doesn't, now listen to this, listen carefully, please. God doesn't want you to depend on his will. He wants you to depend on him. Pause. 
You don't depend on his will. You depend on him. There is a difference because the one is, God, just show me what to do, and then after that, I'll leave you. The other one is, God, I want you, wherever you lead me, wherever you take me, whatever it costs me, and whatever it looks like. Big difference. So here's the conflict with Samuel. He didn't know the Lord yet. But Samuel knew how to bake the bread. That was one of his jobs. He knew how to open the door for the worshipers coming in. And he knew how to shadow Eli around the tabernacle. You know, but there's a big difference between the rituals of religion and a relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Big difference. And sometimes we find ourselves going, going through the motions. You know, we're, we're singing and not really hearing the words. You know, we're, we're listening to the sermon, and, but we're not really hearing the Holy Spirit's nuggets coming in. And we're thinking, and we're so worried about what's next, and not listening to what's now. Amen? Amen. I do. I'm not sitting there talking to my wife having a conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a monster. <laughs> <coughs> so we're having a conversation, and uh, we get better at this. Her and I talking, you know, we can talk about a lot, obviously. But, and and I, I'm answering and asking things before she's even finished. I'm like the king of the interrupters, I know, surprise. <laughs> and she's like, you're thinking about what you're going to say. I didn't even finish talking. <laughs> so you might believe in God, but you can hear things that are hard to hear, but you know he says things from a spirit of grace. He says things from a spirit of love. He says things from a spirit of purpose. And see, most everybody has an eye, right? And I don't know if it's just mine, but I think I've noticed it with a lot of the, even the older models. But when somebody texts me, it's gray. Right? That may, it might be a different color, but it's, in my mind, it's gray. When I text them back, it's blue. Is that pretty much most everybody's phones? Okay? So when somebody texts me, it's gray. When I text them back, it's blue. So sometimes I wonder if my conversations with God is just all gray. It's just God speaking. He's talking. He's prompting. He's trying to talk to me. But it's all him. Why? Because of 1 Samuel 3 9. Look at it. Look at it again. A little, close, a little more closely. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant here. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And we saw the first two times. First two times, God calls Samuel in verses 3 and verses 4. We don't see Samuel laying down in his place. We just see him laying down. Right? And it wasn't until Samuel was in his place. It wasn't until Samuel was in his position. That he was then able to hear God. And not just presume it was something else or somebody else. So if God is dropping off the mail at your home and you're not going to get it, hello, you're not going to get it. <laughs> right? And you're thinking, well, God isn't speaking. He's been speaking all along. Amen. He's been speaking all along, but we just weren't in position to hear him. Once we get in position, the conversation stops being all gray, and now we can say, God, here I am. Here I am. The real me. The honest me. The open me. The ready me. The humble me. The not it's all about me me.
done my will. And I can see how that works out. Doing my will. Amen? So now I'm ready. I'm in position to hear what God has to say. Remember Isaiah. We can go through the Bible and see. Isaiah said, here I am. Moses said, I'm slow of speech. And you saw what I did back there? Here I am. Jeremiah. Teens, listen. Jeremiah said, I'm too young for this. And your people are too stubborn. But here I am. God, if it's your calling, here I am. And another thing to realize it's getting real here. It's to not let, please listen to this. Don't let the calling confuse the cause. Pastor, you're confusing me. <laughs> I was 24 when God called me to be a husband. And the first year after that, I was called to be a daddy to a baby girl. Then 18 months after that, I was called to be a daddy to a little boy. Nine years later, after struggling with compromising my previous calls, I was called to adopt a healthy little girl international from Guatemala. Then I was called to adopt a baby boy with spina bifida. Then I was called to get another baby boy with spina bifida and hepatitis C. Then I was called to adopt a local little girl that God rescued from abortion. Then I was called to adopt a baby boy international with HIV. Then seven year break. <laughs> <laughs> We was in church two years before this adoption happened. And I've never shared this with one. And Chrissy just looked at me and she said, I don't really feel like God's calling us to adopt another baby. I had a different response this time than I did previously because I learned. Because I learned. We have, and this is where the contacts conflict our calling. We had our adoption agency tell us, he ain't gonna win. He's blind. He ain't gonna win. We have the best adoption attorney in Pittsburgh. He ain't gonna win. He's blind. He ain't gonna win. We were 
validated. I say that to couples too. When you got something going on in your married life, whether it be financial, kids, whatever, when there's something that is a Holy Spirit discerned thing in the husband or in the wife, it will become in the other one as well. How the Holy Spirit works, it validates. That way you know. You know it's not just you making a selfish decision. But that was, you know, call it a test, call it a trial, call it faith, call it what you want. It was just God just moving and us positioning to hear our calling. Was it hard? You better believe it was hard. Did we have other things that were going to be hard coming down the pipeline? You better believe it. And shortly after that, we went to Colorado and got eternity. Our other baby. Out of all of our options, the smoothest one we ever had. Smoothest. We still talk about it to this day. That little girl still says crazy things off her lips that go so much in line with her name. And then we had to call and get our little Titus in China. And we was battling with that one. You know, we're like, oh, he's going he's gonna to be the dumbest one, and he's going to be the only Asian one, you know, because we have all these Guatemala ones, and then the two biological, they're the, you know, the, you know, American ones, you know. He's going to have money, but how are we going to do that? Because now, you know, we're old now, and China has stipulations on age, and, and we're like, okay, well, you know, we're called to go get him. We knew that. That was a battle, different battle than victories. Bring him home. It wasn't even about three or four months later. Somebody comes into our office and was a friend of a friend of you know, I goes, and just said that this couple that adopted a baby boy in China over in Apollo had three boys already. Got this baby boy, just felt like that they could do it. Because one of the three boys with special needs. Brought this baby boy in and couldn't do it. Had to disrupt. So they were just talking to an adoptive family that had a lot of experience in adoption and asked if we knew anybody. And it was kind of like, uh -huh. <laughs> well, we'll, well, we'll look around. We were looking for somebody else that God was calling. That's what we were doing. We were actually looking for something. Although, we already knew. We both, that's Chrissy. We both knew in our heart, duh. <laughs> we kind of had this conversation. It's only a few months later. We called out this lady. Got a hold of her. Got a hold of her husband. Said, let's get together. Let's meet. Let's, you know, bring the boys. Let's meet. Went out to Panera's and Apollo. And he was in Panera's for four hours. Just talking and this is a Christian, Christian couple. And uh, and this is we told Bing with us, Bing Titus, they named Bing. And we met Judah for the first time. They called him JJ. And by the way, his name was picked out before we even knew this was gonna happen, and it was Judah. But when I asked Pete, the father, what does J.J. mean, because I didn't know then, he says it means James Judah. So we're on. Needless to say, we answered that call. And Titus got his little buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, if we let any call confuse the calls, then we cut ourselves off from God's blessing. And again, we got little calls that happen all the time, right? There's all kinds of little things that go on. And then as God is walking my family through this crazy, insane life with what he's doing, and we're 
hearing and listening to the call, and, and I'm learning. Don't argue. <laughs> Don't argue. Then, this is where it hits the road. Then, God says to me, do you love me? Remember? Remember what Jesus said to Peter in, in John 21? Watch this. John 21, 15 through 18. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon! <laughs> Son of Jonah, go figure. Do you love me more than these? And Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to Peter, Feed my lambs. Jesus said to Peter again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And by the way, if you remember Peter, Peter had a little bit of arrogance in him. Do you think Jesus knew that? But that was also used for good things too, okay? Jesus said back to Peter, Tend my sheep. Verse 17, Jesus said to Peter, The how many times? He said three again. Are we all not listening? <laughs> Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Listen to me. Now he's in position. Do you see that? Now he's in position. It wasn't grief the first two times, but Jesus knew he needed to be in position so he could hear the question. Because he said to him the third time, just like he was saying to me, this is what God called me. And he said, do you love me? And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. Hello? Hello, church? <laughs> you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, be my sheep. Look at this. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wanted. Paraphrasing, you followed your own will. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. We've got to die to ourselves. Fasting and praying is a wonderful tool to continue dying to ourselves because we're still trapped in these physical bodies. Jesus says, I will take your, I will take you where your flesh doesn't want you to go. So now God calls me into the ministry directly for him. And in my pathetic thinking, I was girded with all these other callings. <laughs> Walking where I wished until I was finally in position to listen and hear his voice. And I shared with you guys a number of times. Man, I did. I wrestled with that calling. And once again, the Holy Spirit just worked through my wife and circumstances and and sometimes it's not as simple as just find your calling. Which one? <laughs> Which one? <clears throat> I'm called to be a husband, I'm called to be a father, I'm called to be a pastor, I'm called to be a friend. All of which are blessings in different ways, but all from God for His purposes. Amen? Amen. Not my will, but thine. Even as Jesus said to God the Father in the garden when He was preparing to be crucified for you and for 
through that through this message. But there's a whole lot of things that's moving in our families, in the news, around us, in our workplace. A lot of things that are moving. Do you think God has some expectations of you? Mm -hmm. Oh, Pastor, I'm too old. If you just said that, you can at least pray. We have, I have had a friend, she, um, her name was Louise, 91 years old, had a, ah, I can't even remember what disease she had when she was a child, but just wheelchair mouth. Man, she was she a prayer warrior. She was a prayer warrior. She knew it, and everybody in the church knew it. And trust me, she'd have a piece of you if you said, Pastor, I don't know what God can use me for. She would have a piece of you. <laughs> She would call you out. She'd be like, what do you think I'm doing? I'm praying. Because I can. And I'm willing. And I'm good. <laughs> we praise the God for the praise God for those warriors. Man. If I had the deacons prepared for communion this morning. This is just yet another thing that we can be doing to position ourselves. It's communion. We did this before we started our fast. We're doing this as we're ending our corporate fasting. I will be encouraging you to always take these opportunities to remember. <laughs>